Awesome. Well, hi, Haley. Hi, Talia. So good to see you. We're bringing on Nikki and Sharon now. And uh, for everyone joining in, we're having our next conversation today focused on unity in the workplace and the world. So Haley, I'm going to hand it over to you and you can get started. You'll see the group here. Hi, Nikki. Perfect. Good morning, Nikki. Hi, Sharon. Hi there. I never know. Okay, we're good with mute, unmute. <laughs> I think we're good. I think we're good. I, I always wind up talking to Talia when she's introducing and I realize she's not talking to me. She's talking to everybody else. Well, good morning, everyone. I am thrilled uh, to see at least you two, Nikki and Sharon. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation today because it's incredibly important and you are both amazing women, amazing female leaders from two organizations, which I believe are really focused on the idea that we're gonna to discuss today. And what we are going to talk about today is the notion of unity, both in the workplace and in the world. I feel like everywhere I turn, people are just constantly talking about how fractured the country is and how divided we are, and that now is a moment to bring people together. It's undeniable, we can't really escape that conversation. So from social issues to politics, to closing economic gaps and workplace gaps, but what we know is that none of this coming together is going to happen overnight. We know it could take years, it could even take generations, and I think probably it will. But I think what we can all agree on is that we have to start now. Um, many of us have begun journeys where we are trying to close gaps and, and progress forward. Um, but this work is really important. It's really urgent in this moment. So this is what we're going to be talking about. I'm really excited to hear from both of you. Before we get started, I thought perhaps you could introduce yourselves and maybe we'll start with you, Nikki. Maybe tell us a little bit about um, you, where you work, and um, why this topic is personally important to you. Yeah. Hi. So I'm Nikki Darden. It's great to meet you, Haley. Um, and I lead... Um, it, we just got. I have a new title, so I always pause before I say it. So I, I lead internal brand engagement and global integration at City, and so really focused on not only how do we think about key initiatives, which by the way includes conversations and work around inclusion um, for our consumers and clients and communities where we, we live and work, but also how do we bring those to life and really pull those through our internal culture. And so um, I think for me personally and professionally, um, We've seen uh, pendulums swing in, in directions that feel very vast. Sometimes they're real and sometimes it's just a perception. Um, and so I think we're really at a point where, listen, we gotta, we gotta have these conversations. I think the conversations um, make such a huge difference. Um, it can feel like we're just talking. Uh, but but I think it's really important, and I've seen quite a bit of, of change across the past, I don't know, eight months or whatever it's been since we've really been digging deep into some of these conversations. So I'm excited to be here and continue, continue that dialogue. Great. Over to you, Sharon. So it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And it's nice to meet you too, Nikki. Um, I'm Sharon Marcel. I've been at BCG for 25 years, um, mostly in the capacity of a client service partner and senior partner. But in the last five years, have have spent a, a good deal of time um, in terms of running the marketing organization and also running our global client team. And in that role, I'm on our, our executive committee and our operating committee. But personally, um, having been at BCG for a very long time, historically consulting was, was probably like financial services, not a particularly diverse uh, work, work setting. And I was actually BCG's first head of the women's initiative back in 2000, which will date me. Um, but from a very uh, early stage, I think I had personal passion in terms of driving um, inclusion, diversity, diversity of thinking. And I think what's certainly true for you know, most of us is, is having a diverse thinking, a diverse acting uh, workforce just makes, makes for a more enriched experience and actually better, better client service. 
I think that's right. And you both said something that I want to um, come back to, including you, Nikki, um, describing some of the change that you've seen over the past eight months. Before we get to that, I do want to sort of tackle maybe what's the elephant in the room, or maybe it's not um, this, this virtual room, but probably every other room, which is politics. We have one week left in the Trump presidency, and I think Congress is uh, perhaps going to vote on an impeachment any moment right now, despite Trump leaving office soon, we know that 74 million people in the country voted for him and the country itself is deeply torn on politics as an issue. Do you think it's possible to bring the country together on these issues um, when he does leave office next week? Um, I don't think it's gonna be next week that we bring the country together. Uh, I guess that's, that's the first thing I'll say. Um, but, I, but I do think it's possible. Listen, I, we have, I, I think we've crossed, it seems we've crossed the proverbial line, right? Um, and I think there are people within, a, a great number of people within that 74 million that you talked about who think, okay, now we've, gone too far. Things have gone too far. Um, and so I don't think there's going to be this kumbaya moment where we all come together and we agree on how this country should be run. Um, nor do I think we should, frankly. I think there is a, a great amount of healthy debate that needs to happen in the country. Um, but um, what we are seeing is movement across the aisle um, where people are saying, you know, we at least need to talk and there are some things that can't, we can't abide by, right. right? And so I think that is likely the first step in that reconciliation and that coming together, but it's just a first step, right? Right, um, right. so perhaps it's the it. beginning of, of unification. Okay. Which, that's right, that's right. That's that's what I think. Uh, it, it's unfortunate that things had to get to where they are for that to happen. Um, I think I said that back in June, it's unfortunate that <laughs> we had, this had to happen for us to, to, to start seeing this movement. But I, but I do think that's, that's what it is. It's a catalyst. Right. Sharon, how about you? I'll just build on, on what Nikki said. I think, I think that's absolutely right. I think on the positive side, if you, you know, I think uh, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden got the most ever popular votes of any presidential and vice presidential candidates. So that's an, so that's another way of, of looking at it. And I do think um, for some of the voters for President Trump, they were voting along economic lines and, and perhaps on issues of regulation and, and other um, more macroeconomic issues or microeconomic issues versus, versus others. Um, so I think it will take time. I think um, this is a divided moment, but, but I, I am hopeful. I'm very hopeful that um, that we can make significant progress. Right, that's a good, um, I think, jumping off point for a question I have for you, Sharon. BCG published a piece called Channeling Outrage uh, into Purpose-Driven Action. Um, I am curious from your perspective, um, what it looks like to use this moment as a catalyst for change within organizations and how BCG is working with your customers and you know, clients, other organizations across various industries to think about um, leveraging this moment. Yeah. Well, I think, I think all of us have changed so much this year in terms of how we work, what we do, the way we work, how we interact, that, that it would be a shame to actually lose some of the energy and momentum that we're all experiencing um, to not actually drive, drive change. And BCG did publish that report. We actually did another piece of work um, around inclusion, um, which I think is, 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 very interesting. So if you take those two pieces, and let me just go through a little bit of, of what that um, what that work said. So we surveyed 4,000 employees in corporate America from a, a range of, of backgrounds. Um, and, and not surprisingly, what we found is that um, for the majority, if you think about the majority of population, you know, 74% of the time they feel included, they feel listened to, um, but for each element of diversity, so whether that's you're a woman or you're a man of race or et cetera, for each element of diversity, the inclusion and, and feel of feeling of connection actually erodes. So 
I think if you take this moment and, and you and you and you think about pulling it together, I think there is a unique opportunity in terms of impacting culture because a lot of companies have made good progress, not great progress, but good progress in terms of recruitment and recruiting diverse slates of candidates. Fewer have made real um, inroads into culture. And once you actually get diverse people into the pipeline, are they heard? Are they listened to? Do you connect with them? And, and do, they, do they then you know, last in your organization and really thrive? And I think this is a moment that we have to actually fundamentally change um, while we change the way we work, while we change other things, change our culture and, and how we address um, the issue of inclusion. Right. And so Nikki, you said when you first opened up that you've seen a lot of change over the past eight months. And I think you would agree with what Sharon's saying in terms of this being a moment for change. Can you describe some of the change that you've seen and how you're thinking about building upon it, what you're looking forward to with that? Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things that are happening. One is, um, I, I alluded to it earlier, there's a lot of talking and um, you know, I sort of thought at, uh, at the end of the year, like enough talking, more doing. Um, but I, I actually think there's a lot of value in the talking. I think there's a lot um, of value in people being heard and seen. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, it's probably more talking and more doing. Um, but so, so there's, there was the talking and then the action. Uh, some of it has been things that city as an organization, but also other organizations may have been doing already mm -hmm. um, and doing in the dark. And I think while again, that is good work, it doesn't to Sharon's point, change culture when we do these things and we don't talk about them and we don't position them as this is how we as an organization operate. This is what we think is important. This is the world that we wanna see and what we're going to support. So if I think about our actions on racial equity that we rolled out with last year, um, a lot of that was work that um, you know we had thought about or started or was on underway that in that we needed to tell the story and say this is a priority it's not just right. something that we're doing in the background and so i think a lot of firms have taken that stance and been much more vocal. Um, we as one, I always say, have found our voice around many of these issues that we had been addressing before. Um, gender pay equity is another one that we've taken a leadership stance on. And then one, just again, just to hone in a little bit on the inclusion piece and the being heard um, is around trans visibility. And we launched, um, a capability for our credit card customers in the US um, last year to enable trans and non-binary people to use their chosen name on their credit card, even if that is different from their legal name. And um, in um, Q at the end of the year in December, actually the female quotient helped us with this. We had an internal boot camp with our colleagues to help people understand why that was important. And I had an offline conversation with a cis straight man from the organization who said, yeah, I went to the boot camp mainly because you were doing it and I wanted to support, but I left feeling seen. I left understanding why this is important because now it feels important to me. I want to be able to show up every day as who I really am and not have to, you know, water it down or, you know, just not be able to be my full self at work too. I get it. Um, and I think those are the conversations and that, that sort of have to come along with the work that help to change culture and help us to move into a different direction. Right, right. And Sharon, I would imagine some of what Nikki's talking about in terms of uh, employees wanting to be heard and be seen is, is uh, it probably came through in your survey of 4,000 employees. Are there other things that they called out that perhaps could be advisable or useful to people who are tuning in now and thinking about how to help um, evolve their own company's culture and then obviously more broadly, you know, culture outside of the workplace? Yeah. And, 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 uh, I really agree um, with what Nikki said. There's been a lot of discussion, which has happened over the last year and, and in increased intensity over the last six months. 
And the discussion has been good. And, and actually people entering into discussion that probably weren't part of it previously. Um, and, and, and part of, again, this, this way of working in this environment has created opportunities to do that. So cohorts, you know, in North America, across the entirety of the partnership, talking about some of these issues and people coming clean with some of what they have faced in terms of, of, of their challenges and, and, and people hearing it and, and really maybe listening for the first time, but certainly listening and thinking about what that means in terms of, of how they behave. We also launched a series around authentic conversations in the workplace, which is a, a BCG initiative, but it's really trying to get at reinforcing the right behaviors in team environments and, and, and calling people out on their behavior and having authentic hard conversations because you can, leadership can publish on it, we can write great stuff and produce surveys. But if in the moment, I don't call someone out, Nikki doesn't call someone out on their behavior, then, then we're really not addressing it. So, so I think we're doing more. And I think there, this increased awareness is, is a very important step in, in terms of driving this cultural change. I agree. Nikki, I want to jump back to you for a second and talk um, a little bit about the notion of driving cultural change that could perhaps start in the organization. But of course, you've got a massive customer base and you're deeply embedded in communities around the world. So um, City is long known for driving progress in various areas. How are you thinking about starting internally? And it seems like this is your new job, in fact, actually, to weave together, you know, thematically the internal changes that you want to see, but also, you know, out in the field and out with customers and communities, especially given that different communities deal with different challenges. And there are so many things that we're all wrestling with. Um, how do you think about that? And, and how would you um, advise people to think about that too, basically bringing the internal changes they wanna see out into the world? Yeah, um, I think um, culture is a big one for us and, and, and truly a, an intense focus as we move forward. Um, you know, and as I think about sort of the importance of our colleagues sort of understanding what we as a firm think is important and how we want to move forward and what we want to drive forward in the communities where we live and work. Um, I think about it as 200,000 ambassadors around the world. Um, and, you know, if you can get those 200,000 ambassadors who then have, particularly as we think about our corporate clients, right, who are interacting with the senior most leaders um, around corporations, across corporations, um, mid and, and small businesses and everything else around the world, plus um, our, our millions of consumer card members and, and, and banking customers. If we can talk, just think about that platform and the magnitude, um, then things that we truly believe in really sort of flow through the ecosystem. And I'm making it, I'm oversimplifying it, um, but I do think in some ways it's simple, right? With consistency of message, with clarity of message, um, and with ensuring sort of that buy-in um, and, and belief. And I think, again, I, I I keep saying it, I'm sorry, I feel like a broken record, but what I've seen is that those conversations, um, whether they are one-on-one, -on -one, we conducted what we call Sparks sessions. Um, and we, we started these um, just as part of another sort of departmental um, conversation that we had, but then started having these sessions where people could come and speak off the record, safe space, on a given topic, understand more and have those conversations so that it's like, ah, I get it. This just sparked for me. Um, and again, helps then to bring that through to the work. So it all sort of builds on each other. We did it around um, racial justice first um, and had conversations that we just never had in our organization before, quite honestly. Um, and we had um, similar conversations at senior executive levels where our CEO and our uh, CFO spoke to the organization about their personal relationship, a white man and a black man who have had a personal relationship and um, 
one never understood some of the challenges that the other faced on a day-to-day basis. Um, And so just having that transparency, and these are conversations that women, Mm -hmm. that people of color, that people from the LGBTQ plus community, I'm certain from people with disabilities have all the time within their communities and other folks, you know, haven't necessarily been brought in. We can be flippant about, well, you should have known, um, but the fact is we gotta have the conversations for people to really understand and create that empathy and pull that through to the work. Right, right, right. I like that a lot. Um, Sharon, maybe you want to build on that. And also, I'm, I'm curious because BCG does work across so many different sectors, you know, how you think about each sector leveraging its voice and place in the community to really drive impact and, and cultural change. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And, and what Nikki said is absolutely true. Again, just being a, a little bit of a numbers geek. So if you, if you look at the data, not only the points I, I said about diverse you know, elements of diversity and feeling less heard and less included, but if you look at leadership across corporate America, so you look at the top, the C-suite across corporate America, what, what you see is, is actually their understanding of that gap is, is 10 to 15 points. So they, they, in other words, they will say, you know, I think everyone does feel heard. I think everyone does feel included. I think this is a place where you succeed based on your merit. So there's this dissonance in, in terms of where people are and what, what some of the leadership really understand. And so the conversation is super important. Look, you know, this is a, a topic for sure at BCG. It's been a topic for many years, but it's been accelerated. But across our clients, I mean, two core topics right now are the future of work and how we're going to work together and, and culture and how we're going to get the best out of um, out of our people, uh, you know, which are the core assets of many, many of our businesses. Some businesses have have other core assets, but many, many of our businesses really about the people and, and the competitive advantage is gained by harnering, by, by first of all, recruiting in the best people and then harnering the capabilities of, of those people to work in teams to, to do great things. And, and it is a topic that, that we're discussing with many, many, many of our clients. And, and there is, is both, I think, a social understanding that's important, but I think more importantly, or at least as importantly, there's a business understanding right. that to create competitive advantage, you really, you have to get this right. Right. So you mentioned leadership, which is a good segue to that as just a topic. Um, I think the new Edelman Trust Barometer is out and it's sort of saying that businesses are the one institution that are trusted now. And I think that we could all agree, certainly with the Business Roundtable coming out, a a consortium of 180 companies who have come out and said that um, business needs to stand for something and they need to take a a role in society and helping to drive change. But yet you're saying at the same time, Sharon, that most leaders um, have a disconnect in their understanding of what employees feel about what they're doing. So um, how can both things be true? Businesses both need to step up, but leaders are not necessarily clear on what needs to happen, or maybe you can um, help uh, sharpen that point a little bit. I think um, so. The business roundtable, for sure. Even the Chamber of Commerce, if you if you read what what they have been, what their CEO has been writing over the past weeks, um, you know, it is it is more forward leaning than um, than it has been. And and I would say um, businesses ha- have stepped in over the last years um, in into a void that that has been created um, on the federal sector. And I think that's a, a great step in. I think. So there's an understanding of the need for businesses to step into that void and, and to actually drive more than bottom line. It, you know, years ago when we were in business school, it was about the bottom line. It was about shareholder returns. And I think many, many CEOs see their remit as, as much broader than that and actually see a virtuous circle behind inclusion and, and culture and, and that return to shareholders, but, but they see their mandate as broader. But I think still in the day to day, you know, if you've been in business for 30 years and you've worked a certain way with a certain group of people with certain norms, you don't necessarily see the challenges of, of people that are outside of that group. And so I think both can exist, like this, this realization that there's a need from a social perspective and from a business perspective, but then also a gap in being able to do it. And so we are working with companies in terms of trying to close that gap. Right, great, thanks. Nikki, on leadership, what do you think leaders can do to help drive more unity both internally and and externally? 
Yeah, I think it's important to um, be transparent, call a thing a thing, and um, act quickly and decisively. And I think that's something that um, lots of leaders, most leaders um, are comfortable with when it comes to driving sales, revenue, um, you know, controls, all of those kinds of things. Uh, but when it comes to people and culture, social issues, oftentimes um, there's a little bit more of a hesitation um, that emerges as to how forward, how bold, how loud um, can we be? How quick should we be? How quickly should we react to certain things? How proactive? Um, I think we are in a moment now where that quick and decisive action is being, is receiving positive reinforcement. And so, um, you know, inertia is what's gotten us to where we are. Um, and so I think if we uh, start to ride this momentum and embrace this change and say, okay, let's keep going, um, let's keep pushing, I, I think change comes, you know, and, and it is bold, bold decisions. What we've seen is, you know, bringing in um, a very diverse group of senior leaders being very active and decisive and intentional on doing that. And those leaders start to make change throughout their organizations as they look at new talent. Um, and not just new talent, but inclusion, right? So a seat at the table, a voice in the conversation, um, an impact on what we're doing. Um, and so we're seeing that happen, again, partly because it is expected. I think 67 percent of consumers believe that a company has to stand for more than um, just whatever their core business is. And so, so we're in a moment where there's a lot in it for us to do the right thing. And so I think just like we've allowed inertia to keep us where we are, we, like I said, we've really got to harness that momentum um, and ride this wave and, 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 and continue to push the wave mm -hmm. um, forward. Mm -hmm. I agree with all of this. Okay. I've written down some really good takeaways because I think you both have made some excellent points and given us some things that we can start to work off of if we're not already and build off of, but I want to give you the chance to just, um, to say any more uh, about this, about your thoughts on unity or anything you think people should be specifically thinking about over the course of the next couple of weeks as we do get deeper into this new year and um, try to take advantage of this moment. Sharon, I'll turn it to you first. So I, I um, first of all, it's such an important topic and one where I have so much passion and, and I'm, I'm really happy. It's getting so much attention. And I think, I think we have to always not forget how far we've come um, and, and continue to push further. I'm also reminded of right in the heart of the pandemic in, in my marketing organization, we pulled together some inspirational um, quotes just to kind of keep us going. And we shared that as a team. And, and I'm reminded of that, you know, um, and a quote by Marie Curie, which I'm going to get exactly wrong, um, or at least precisely wrong, but maybe the gist of it will come through, which is, she said something, you know, nothing in life is to be feared. You know, it's to be understood. And then once you gain that in-depth understanding, you can you can fear it less. You can address it and fear it less. So I'm inspired by the change that that is happening and um, excited that it will keep happening at pace. I love that. Thank you. I always looking for inspirational quotes to help center myself and, and get me through any intense moments. Nikki, over to you. Um, I won't quote Marie Curie. I will quote Violet Bridgerton, because like most people, <laughs> I hope uh, I binge that over the holiday. <laughs> um, and while she was talking about marriage, I think it applies to where we are today. Um, driving this change, getting this right is a choice that you have to make every day. And I think we all have to make the choice to do a little better, to be more inclusive, to bring people in um, every single day. And we can't get complacent and we can't settle for the status quo. So I'm not married. I take my marriage advice from Violet Bridgerton, probably a bad decision. But on that one, I think she got it right. 
I love that. Uh, naturally, you both have great words of wisdom. Um, I'm going to jump in with a couple of key takeaways and then I think we'll wrap. Um, a couple of things you said that are really important and resonated. Now is a moment to drive change. And as Nikki reminded us, keep pushing, change will come. Uh, listening is very important and authentic conversations per Sharon, you know, in the workplace are also so important. Um, employees are ambassadors in communities and around the world. So don't forget that. Companies also are platforms that can drive change. So think smartly about using those platforms. Um, I did take note of the gap in leadership understanding. So I think it's incumbent upon leaders to get into the organization, listen more, understand more deeply, not assume that you have it right and continue to be focused on the change that you wanna see. Um, and that leadership needs to be decisive and intentional moving forward. But um, I'm gonna end on this note that now is a moment to drive change, keep pushing, change will come. And we are inspired by this moment to help drive unity both internally and around the world. Thank you both so much for joining this conversation and for all that you offered. Um, I learned a lot. I hope everybody listening in did too. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. That was a perfect conversation as we go into the next few weeks. Haley, Nikki, Sharon, thank you. Our next conversation is focused on changing the face and building a digital future that works for everyone. We're so thrilled to bring on Serple and Matt and Annalie, who you'll see here in just a second. And for everyone just joining us, thank you and welcome to our last day at the Virtual Quality Lounge at CES. Shelly, you can uh, come on the camera now and I'm gonna hand it over to you to get started as we bring on the other speakers. Okay, good morning, Talia. And I think for this conversation, we are gonna have a very big group coming in from all parts of the world. So good afternoon and good evening for everyone. Hi, Serpal, how are you? You're on mute. And hi, Matt. And Annalie, I hi, don't Susan. see you hi, yet. Matt. Hi, both of you, welcome. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Perfect, up oh, there's Annalie. Hi, Annalie, how are hi, you? Hi, hello, hello, good morning from the snowy Finland. In Finland. Okay, very good. Matt, where are you coming in from? I am in London, formerly in Europe, but now <laughs> in the UK. Very good. Serpil, where are you coming in from? I was supposed to be in London, but I'm in my hometown, Istanbul, right now. Well, there you go. You know, I think that it's the perfect segue to this um, conversation, technology as an enabler, technology also as something that um, is a a democratizer. It's a way of bringing all of us together from all parts of the world to have this really important conversation about technology. And th this conversation is called Change the Face. Very excited to hear all about that, building a digital future that works for everyone. So for everyone joining in in this conversation, also, this is an interactive conversation. We love your input. We love your comments. We love your suggestions. And we really love your questions. And I will weave them all in if you ask them. So get going, get busy, and uh, we're going to get started. Okay, with that, let's each introduce ourselves. Circle, if you can start, tell me who you are, what you do, and tell me what your definition of a digital future that works for everyone is. Like, what does that mean to you? Um, I am um, the CEO of the EU cluster at Vodafone Group. I'm also very privileged to be uh, steering uh, the diversity and inclusion committee uh, since 2013 globally at Vodafone. So obviously, personally, this is a very passionate topic for me. And also connecting everyone to a better future is the purpose uh, of our company. So this conversation is super important for us and very relevant for us. In the broadest sense, I would say that um, uh, building a, a digital future is about really creating an inclusive digital society through democratizing uh, the digital technologies and the opportunities it brings to everyone everywhere. And unfortunately, the recent events, the pandemic has shown us that uh, all the efforts we're making in terms of uh, e more equality of opportunities 
uh, are also going back. And uh, as we think about how do we build back the future in a more inclusive way, we're very conscious of the pivotal role the digital technologies plays uh, in, this, in, in terms of providing equal opportunities to everyone to progress their livelihoods, their businesses, and also the progress opportunities for the societies and economies. And therefore, we're very conscious that in the future digital transformation that has already started in a very fast pace, thanks to COVID in a way, uh, we, we need to make sure that nobody is left behind in that transformation. Perfect, thank you. You know, it's interesting when you talked about we have to build back. Um, one of the things that we talk a lot about is we need to create we have the opportunity now to create the um, equity, the equality that we want to see. We don't want to go back. We want to create forward. And a lot of the initiatives that we're going to hear about how you're all coming together to do that is, is going to drive that significant change. Um, Matt, tell us all about you. Well, firstly, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Shelley, for inviting me. And, and uh, um, like, my job at Google is to run operations in Africa, the Middle East and Europe. And I think a lot about technology working for everyone. Um, firstly, from the cultural standpoint, you know, we rely a lot on technology that's built in Silicon Valley. And that has to work for people in South Africa, Finland, Italy, wherever. Secondly, technology that's built largely by men. Uh, Google, I think, was the first of the big companies to um, divulge our gender balance, which is, you know, frankly, appalling on the tech side of things. But we've made a bunch of progress from like 17%, I think, of women in tech, when we first started reporting a few years ago to sort of more than 24. Mm -hmm. There's an awful lot more to do on gender in the people. Who direction build. forward. You know, we're a company whose mission is um, organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful for everyone. And that for everyone piece is so important. So there's cultural diversity, but there's also just the representation of the population in the people who build the product. So I always say if we want to build products that work for everyone, they need to be built by everyone. And the industry and business as a whole has got a lot of work to do there. And I also want to point out, you talked about 17% to 24%. That's progress. And, you know, we might not be at 50, but we are moving forward. And I think that as long as we continuously move forward with consciousness and intentionality, we are, you know, moving, you know, forward in the right direction. And we need to um, give ourselves credit for that, too. You know, oftentimes we're like, well, you only move 7%. That's a lot. And, you know, as long as we are always moving forward, then, you know, I'm very, um, very hopeful and very excited about, you know, the direction. So thank you for that. Hi, Annalie. Hi, Shelley. Good to be here. Great to have you here, especially from Finland. Excited. <laughs> yeah. Uh, along those lines that Sir Bill and Matt were sharing, um, Nokia, Nokia's mission is to create the technology to connect the world. And, uh, as, as Serpil said, no one can be left behind. Um, and this digital society, we, we, we take digital divide seriously. And I was just reading through some, uh, some uh, data. According to the ITU, 3 billion people are still offline. And uh, UNICEF estimated that one third of the world's school children were unable to access remote learning when COVID-19 started. So these are the issues uh, that um, Nokia uh, takes seriously and wants to provide solutions for. Um, and, and digital inclusion is, is part of Nokia's mission. Um, internally, uh, we really think about inclusion and diversity from a business angle. And it's, it's important that we, we bring in new people with new ideas. Um, uh, and diverse people, especially. So I'm head, head of inclusion and diversity at Nokia, and my name is Anneli, Anneli Kars. Fantastic, Anneli. So I, I wanna get right to it because we've talked about, and you used really important phrases, Anneli, which was digital divide. And then you also, in the same sentence, used digital inclusion and how important that is. We need to move from the digital divide and the inequity of technology and technology access to digital inclusion. So Serpil, I wanna to come to you because what you have all done and you talk about the cluster, let's discuss the collective action 
of, you know, what you are all doing around, you know, bringing the technology sector together so that you can reflect the world that we operate in, you know, in a whole new way and, and really create, you know, the, the impact and the effect of diversity and inclusion. Can you just tell us, you know, how this all came about and, you know, what that, that, that is? Sure. I think uh, all of our companies in the technology sector are really working hard to, to, on diversity and inclusion topic. And we have many, many initiatives. Nevertheless, um, two years ago, we made a research uh, with 8,000 participants globally. And the respondents basically said that, as Matt also touched, that uh, if, te- if you were to describe technology as a person, they would predominantly describe it as um, young, white, uh, middle class, uh, and male. Uh, and this is pretty uh, factual also, because when you look at, for example, the EU Commission report lately, only 20 per- 21% of the digital jobs are taken by women. And more importantly, um, the researchers in several countries uh, among women say that, you know, they are really not considering technology and digital as a career. Only 19% of the women in the UK uh, are saying that, you know, they would consider uh, a job in the tech and and digital sector. So um, we really need to accelerate uh, our our initiatives here. And although many of these reputable companies and uh, the two of them are with us today are doing extreme hard work on this, it's going slow. So the idea we came up with last year was to, how, how can we accelerate in changing the face of tech by collaborating across companies and uh, basically sharing more of our best practices, learnings, experiences, so that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And also in um, collaborating more in initiatives that are pretty similar. So instead of doing them in silos, if you like, can we come together to accelerate the impact through a more collective action? And that's basically changed the face. And uh, so we're very excited uh, to have uh, Google with us and uh, Nokia with us. And we have like 14 companies now that have really been shown interest. So we'll, we'll have more conversations around how can we synergize together. I I just, you know, that just brings such a big smile to my face because we always say we're better together. It's what the female quotient is all about, bringing a bunch of companies to work together. You know, one of the reasons I think we've gone backwards historically is we're all doing the same thing separately. And we have a finite amount of resources. You know, if we could all come together to move forward, this is where competition you know, really does not exist. We are really working together, uniting so that we could advance diversity and inclusion, which is the whole purpose of it. So Matt, I want to go to you and talk about the power of the collective. What have you found um, from participating in this collective action, you know, from the Google perspective, has it helped you advance further? Have you learned more? Um, Tell me the the better together story from your perspective. Yeah, thank you, Shelley. I mean, I think uh, absolutely. Um, It's if you're in one of these companies where you know the engineers are trying to invent totally new things and and wow people with technology that looks like magic uh sometimes it's challenging to say well hang on we could probably learn from outside and not just invent everything ourselves and i think one of the key things for people like me on the sort of business and operation side has been to, to try to connect much more with the world because we learn a lot from companies like vodafone and others who've made some progress in their own organization so Firstly, that, that's a really important thing. Secondly, I think just to complement what Serple said, we've been trying to do stuff outside too. So one of the problems I think is a perception that technology for me, as you say, it's the kind of, it's the white guy, you know, it's not something that women will get into, or it's not something that's culturally appropriate in lots of countries to even think of as a career. And um, triggered by the EU about five or six years ago, they had a report that said millions of jobs are gonna go unfilled because of a lack of digital skills. And so we started off in Spain doing some partnership work with a couple of other companies. Could we train some people in digital skills with online learning and classroom learning? And it's tough. We were blown away by demand. 
And now we've trained around the world 70 million people in digital skills. It's not like to be a coder, but more, how do I use a website? How can I do online marketing? Could I put this to work and actually build a career in it? And so I said, we've been blown away by demand. We've always done it in partnership. So whether it's Deutsche Post and PayPal in Germany, or whether it's the Chambers of Commerce and Small Business Federation in Italy, never on our own because we don't know all of the stuff, but um, blown away by demand. Second thing I say is um, it's almost 50-50 female male. So the people who we trained, um, uh, it's a specifically gender or youth targeted program have, have been largely representative of the population, which suggests there is a desire and there is a will and there is a fit uh, for women in technology as well. So I'm, I'm really optimistic in the long term about that, even if our education system is struggling to move uh, that far. So always in partnership, learning and inspired from others. And I think the other thing I'd say, Shelley, is you know this pandemic, more than any other time, I think it's shown us how technology has leapt forward. It's been a lifeline to people in lockdown. It's going to be critical to come back. And therefore, I think governments and companies like ours and you know, uh, community organizations and people need to work together in a way we've never done before if we want to recover faster and better. And so I'm kind of optimistic about that, given these conversations taking place and how clear it is that this technology does now need to work for everyone. The people who aren't connected and the people who are not represented in building it. Oh, fantastic. And, you know, one of the things when Serpil was describing the face of technology, if you asked, you know, uh, consumers, what does technology look like if it were a person and it's a white middle class male? You know, all I kept thinking about was technology used to be cold and, you know, you would think that it's just not very inviting. And how do we make it warm and welcoming? You know, I just kept thinking of those adjectives. How do we make it warm and welcoming so that everybody wants to put a big, you know, hug around it and, and be able to, to feel comfortable with it and that it's not so scary, um, which I think is very interesting. And we're going to come back to that because some questions are coming in already. Adelie, um, how has this partnership uh, been for you? It, it has been great, and I, I really echo what Matt and uh, Serpil has have just said. Um, perhaps building on on our need, uh, our sort of mission uh, and and belief that digital inclusion is bridged with everyone having high speed broadband access, and and especially bringing in and working with the young people to make sure in 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 underprivileged countries where children are still connect, unconnected in schools to make sure that we, we provide those accesses. And we are, we are working um, hard both in South Africa as well as in Kenya with, with a lot of schools um, to, to provide that access. And actually a collaboration was mentioned here as, as key for, for, for the um, progress and we work both with Vodafone Foundation as well as with Google on, on several uh, projects to, to uh, bring broadband connectivity to, to people in rural areas and, and make them connected. So I think um, also are the socio, changing the socioeconomic status of those people who are uh, privileged to high speed connectivity is important. Well, and it also brings up a whole conversation around digital trans transformation in the workplace of, you know, how do we really create a more inclusive or cultural belonging, a place that everyone feels comfortable, diverse and inclusive, you know, workplace environment. So Matt, you want to open up a conversation of, you know, your thoughts around, um, around that? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously we... The first step, as you pointed out, is to admit you've got a problem and publishing our numbers and committing to make a change for us has been a really important step. Um, and then also trying to understand better, and we're a data-driven company, so we do a massive internal survey every year trying to understand how people perceive being at the company, all kinds of aspects of getting things done, feeling included, making progress and so on. And that gives us really helpful data. And you know, one of the things we found is that the experience of the company is, is not the same across groups. And underrepresented groups typically, you know, there are things which are not so good for them as, the, as they are for the, the, you know, the majority. And so, you know, that applies in some areas to women, but particularly, I think, for uh, underrepresented racial ethnic groups. And, you know, we've, we've seen this year 
hopefully um, a, a movement that's including all of us in making, uh, you know, addressing racism, something that we all spend time doing, recognizing we have to be active about that. So that's one of the things that's really exercised us is, is really trying to understand what we can do to improve the culture for those kinds of groups. And, you know, one of the challenges, obviously, just as we've seen over, over decades for women in business is where are the role models? Where are the people I can look at and go, actually, that I can see myself in that role. So that's one of the challenges. And we think about that, not just in the company, but also in our products, right? So if you search, you know, for an image of an engineer on Google, right, what do you see? Well, actually, what you see now is a pretty representative sample of engineers in terms of gender and race but in the past you might not have seen that so there's an obligation responsibility there I think as well as internally um, culturally so there's an awful lot I think you know to accept there's an awful lot of work to do making progress is helpful in galvanizing people I think the final thing I'd say you know partly given my representation on this call it's vital that the majority you know the um, the privileged straight white men in the world step up and get engaged in the conversation and are not afraid to make a mistake and get it wrong and occasionally offend people because it's much worse to do nothing than, um, than you know, to, to try and use your voice in, in a positive way. So that's personally a journey for me that I've sometimes found difficult, but it's also, also been incredibly rewarding when you can see how just putting people in place and giving them the chance really changes things. You know, it's, it's really, um quite remarkable because all the work that Google is doing with um, Getty and Getty images and, and truly changing the face. And so that's why I, I really am so hopeful with this collective action that you're all taking together of even talking about change the face. It's intentional. There are so many faces out there, so, so much diversity in the tech space. It's showcasing them. And as the co-founder of See Her, if you could see her, you could be her. If you change the face and start showing all these faces, representation equals reflection. Reflection creates the change. Change creates the impact that we all need to see. So I'm going to tie in one big question that you can each pull one part. When we talk about change the face, collective action, it's about the people we have in the business of technology. It's about the consumers that are, you know, buying the products, the goods and services. And we know that consumers today have purpose in their DNA and they expect this from companies that they're going to buy from today. And they will look it up and they will do their Google searches and they will, you know, see if companies are walking the talk, you know, consistently. So it's about internal workplace. It's about supply chain. It's about consumers. And it's also about product and product design. So in any of those areas, pick one that you want to talk about. Um, and Matt, you had the question about designing products. So I'm putting that in there and I'm giving you a little heads up to pick that, that, that side of it. Um, if you could each pick one of those areas and talk about what um, you are doing in any of those areas to impact change, to walk the talk and to hold yourselves accountable. Um, Anna Lee, we'll start can, with you. Yeah, can you just repeat the area? Sorry. I... So everything about diversity and changing the face of technology comes from the consumer perspective of how you engage with consumers in your media and in representation, you know, reflection of changing the face and the images that you use and the spokespeople that you have to your supply chain, diversity in the supply chain, to um, making the technology more accessible to internal work, workplace right. transformation, any of the areas that are the ingredients and the steps towards changing the face of technology. Yeah, let me pick that internal um, digital transformation, how we, how we leverage that uh, in, in three different ways, basically in talent management, where we, we really curiously pilot different type of AI solutions at Nokia. Um, uh, of course, we are very aware of of the uh, data that is that that is used. That it can be very biased. However, um, I would say that I have just run an um, unconscious bias with uh, with all company managers, over seven thousand managers, and I would say that unbiasing AI is almost easier than unbiasing people. So, <laughs> so, uh, but there are three areas, as I said. So. Uh, promoting more inclusive ways of working, 
um, talent management, talent acquisition, and uh, which is quite obvious. I, I think we all are ex experimenting in that area, but then also equalizing the opportunities. Um, uh, in, in that inclusive ways of working, I think um, most of our women at Nokia, as well as across the world, are uh, caretakers. Either they are raising, raising their children or taking care of the elderly parents and, and providing those digital tools to them that are reliable, that uh, allow them the flexibility, but also the product predictability of their work is sort of um, diminishing the importance of physical space and, and mobility uh, and and uh, they can work from wherever. Also, uh, this is very helpful for people with disabilities at, at Nokia. They don't need to commute. They can work from where they are. And, and of course, the equal opportunities to learn upskill uh, equal opportunities to apply to any jobs across the world and work where you are, uh, from where you are, uh, is is important. Perhaps those things I would highlight. Thank you so much. And you know, bias in, bias out. So it's it's another reason we need to change the face uh, because if we don't have diversity in programming and working on technology, you know, on the other end, we will see uh, the bias come on the other side. Serpil, what about you? Kelly, you're asking me a very tough question to select because- Of course, because you want to answer all of them because you're working in all of them. Right, but I've been always an advocate that if you really want to make an impact on gender topic, it shouldn't be an HR project, it shouldn't be a commercial project, it should be everything. Therefore, the whole organization is galvanized around you know thinking about inclus inclusiveness huh? and we, yeah. we call this the force for the approach i just want to yeah. say for everyone listening in top down bottom up and all around it's everyone's exactly so we call it the four c's which is the customers communities colleagues and the co-partners the suppliers and this is what we do in the diversity and inclusion steerco it's a multifunctional team you know, reviewing all of our initiatives. But anyway, if you want me to pick one, I'll pick the customers and the, which has an impact on the communities. So the idea we came up with back in actually 2014, when we saw that there was a gender gap of 23 percentage points in terms of internet access mm -hmm. and 14 percentage points in terms of basic mobile phone ownership. We thought this was really core to our company strategy that we need to do something around it. So we came up with women segment propositions. These are obviously commercial propositions uh, only towards women. And, uh, and in emerging markets, we have said that we will connect 50 million unconnected women through that. And now I'm pleased to say that 20 million of that is done, but we still have time to go. But what we also do is in those propositions, we build certain apps that help women in their local needs. So yes. this could be a mom and care, mom and baby care app in Africa, which is really working really well because they don't have access to health services uh, as in developed markets. And, uh, or I'm sorry to say, but it's a reality. We have launched a domestic violence app in many of our markets. It's a global initiative. Unfortunately, there's more demand to it during these days of the pandemic. And, uh, and it helps really, it's really an urgent emergency service for uh, some of, in some of them connecting to the police if needed, or their, you know, support, um, um, uh, community uh, and another one is the digital skills so we have uh, we're offering digital skills uh, learning exper uh, experiences uh, as well as entrepreneurial skills in some of our markets so the idea is a commercial proposition but on top of it some apps that really help women excel and uh, help close the divide in learning and tools and also support initiatives 
Oh God, so we have to regroup back with collective action because we're working with women in a hundred countries. And if we could target, you know, delivery of specific needs to advance, you know, those women in those markets. So let's let's circle back on that. Matt, bring us home very quickly so I don't get in trouble for being overtime. Product design, how important that is for um, inclusivity and in technology. Yeah, well, I mean, I think Serpil and Annalie are sort of providing the infrastructure. We're trying to provide products that work for everyone and really help to scale to everyone. So the first piece is things like Android, massively lowering the cost of getting online through a device. Uh, but then there's also making sure that the products you're building are not sort of inherent biased. And we're trying to work hard on AI and the revolution that's there, which is hugely empowering, but to make sure that there are principles about unbiasing. That's hard work, as you may see. Uh, and, and I think the other the other pieces you say is is recognizing that you can use your supply chain uh, to make progress as well. And, and you know, Serpil and yeah. I, we work hard as partners and collaborators and competitors sometimes, and that helps. But, you know, for example, in our marketing, we try to make sure that the teams providing us from other companies with marketing services are diverse. But also, as we did, as we did that, what we started to see that and diversity on screen in our ads and so on, we started to realize we were doing diversity, but with stereotypes. So I think some of the work UN Stereotype has done has been really helpful there to sort of say, let's actually show a different vision of the world through what we do. So it's so multi-level, um, but really important to, I think the first step is like being aware of that and the responsibilities that we all have with the scale that this technology can now reach. So well, I you know, lots that's of work that's... to do. The conversation is so important. I'm grateful to you for, for bringing us together and allowing us in to, to learn from each other. Uh, listen, it, 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 we always say we're better together. That is very clear. When we talked about what does technology look like if it's a person, white, male, middle class, um, middle management, we know you guys are going to change the face. All I kept thinking about was what does a heart look like? And it looks like each of you. And I just want you to know that I, we are so appreciative for you bringing the industry together to work together to advance women, advance equality, advance diversity, advance inclusion across the entire ecosystem uh, for change. We can change the face together. We will change the face together. Thank you to each of you and all that you do. Big heart. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Amazing conversation around collective action and, and so great to have everyone joining us from all around the world. Uh, for everyone tuning in, thank you. We've had a wonderful day so far. We're taking an hour break now and we'll be back at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. Thanks, everyone.